For those of you that don't know me, I am Tyler Lutz, and I'm the youth director here at TPC. I've been honored to be able to be here and preach for you a couple times, and I want to make one apology to the choir because they've had to look at the back of my head a couple of times where this is the good stuff, this is just hair. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for that. But in all seriousness, we're going to dive into the Word of God now. And we're going to be speaking about the story of Cain and Abel, a story we're probably all familiar with. So if you would like to turn to Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 1 through 16. I am reading from a different translation, so it might be a little different, but you can still follow along. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And then the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word this morning. Now as we try to unpack it, let our hearts and our ears and our minds all be open to accept the truths here in this passage. Let us have a better understanding of what is happening in Cain's heart. And on top of that, let us have a better understanding of what is going on in our own hearts, God. We give you all the praise and all the glory for you're the only one worthy of it. Amen. Jealousy, greed, envy, anger, hatred, and even murder. These are all things that we would agree are bad. They are sins or they could lead to sin. But why do we see them over and over again? We see them throughout history. We see it in our day-to-day lives. We see it in the entertainment industry because it makes a lot of money. We see it in movies after movies, book after book, TV show after TV show. There are shows out called How to Get Away with Murder and Scandal. Not saying they're bad shows, I've never seen them, but they're all wrapped up in these themes. We have books, if you're familiar with The Count of Monte Cristo, it's a story about two friends, one betrays the other, and the rest of the story is all about revenge. And then we have movies after movies, all filled up with these themes. And speaking of movies, the new Star Wars movie is coming out, Uh, hopefully some of you are aware of that, maybe a little bit. Um, I'm excited, Um, and so because of that, I kind of went back through the first six films to make sure I got all the plot, like I I know the story, I know what's happening. Um, and I first started again with, with episodes one, two, through three, which are the ones that were made later. 
okay? Um, so I went through those three, and if you go on the internet today, I don't know how often you guys are on the internet, and if you try to like do your research on episodes one, two, three, a lot of people do not like them. All right, they think that they're nowhere close to the original three, and that's fine. Um, but I do think there is good character development in those stories, and specifically in episode three, titled Revenge of the Sith. Now, it's kind of where the story gets dark, and it gets dark pretty fast. See, for the most of the world, we already knew that Anakin Skywalker was going to become who? Darth Vader. Darth, Darth Vader, right. If you didn't, I just spoiled it, and my bad. <laughs> okay? So we already knew that Anakin Skywalker was going to become Darth Vader. All right? But in Episode 3, we actually see it happen. All right? In Star Wars, you have, you have this light side and this dark side, and it's like always combating against each other. And so we see the dark side start to creep into Anakin's heart and corrupt it. All right? So we start to see things get really bad. We see Anakin and his heart and the anger that's filled with it. And now his willingness to kill, his actions were fueled by this dark side. It snuck in and now it was corrupting him down to his core. It led him to do some horrible things. If you're familiar with his story, you will know what they are. So if you... So if you just know that the dark side crept in, all right? The reason why I bring that up is because I think something similar here is happening with Cain and Cain's heart. So our passage today comes from Genesis 4, the fourth chapter in the entire Bible. And it's a story about hatred, envy, murder. How did it get bad so fast? If you know what redemptive history is, if you, and if you don't, that's okay. Basically, it's a way of thinking of all of history in four acts, okay? First, God created everything. That's act one. And then act two is the fall, where sin entered the world. So you can see act one, creation, in Genesis 1 and 2. You see God creating all things. He makes all things good, all things perfect. Everything was beautiful, perfect, and good in God's eyes. And then on top of that, he made man and woman in his own image, setting them apart from everything else, giving them dominion over all things God created. Everything was awesome at that point. Everything was perfect and good. Then we see chapter 3, act 2 of redemptive history, and that's the fall. We see Adam and Eve being deceived by a serpent. The serpent plants a seed of doubt into Eve's heart, and it grows and leads to the first sin. And now sin is in the world. And God punished Adam and Eve, banishing them from the garden, but the impact of sin was already here. No take backsies. Sin was widespread through all that God originally made good. Just, it started with a little doubt in Eve's heart and it grew to her action. They disobeyed God, now sin was everywhere. And you would think that sin might start slowly, might build up to something might tarnish the world over time. But you see in the very next chapter of the Bible, and the, only the fourth chapter in the Bible, the verses that we're coming from this morning, it's all already led up to murder. Murdering of a man. Murdering a brother from another brother. Murdering what God created as a good and perfect image of God. Things got bad real fast. So the perfect creation is gone. Sin is widespread, and we see its effects through the story of Cain and Abel, and we also can see it still today. And this is all bringing me to the first point, and that's the problem with sin and where it is and where it starts. See, we all sin. Cain's not the only sinner, okay, that we're going to be talking about. We're also talking about our own sin. Everybody that walked in here, we are all sinners. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We need Him to help us. So my first point is regarding where our sin starts, where it festers, and that is that the sin builds up in the heart. To see this build up first, let's go back to the beginning of our text. We see what's happening here. We see Eve thrilled that she's given a man with the help of God. And then it's followed by Abel, another man. And it's interesting to note that Abel, when translated, is vapor or breath, something that's there and gone. It's a pretty accurate description of who Abel was, if you think about it. And then we see these two brothers growing up. We see Cain working the ground and Abel working with sheep. And then we see the first documented offering towards God. Cain brings fruit of the ground. Abel brings the firstborn sheep and appropriate fat portions. And then we see God's response. This is where everything starts to roll on in Cain's heart. 
He shows favor towards Abel. He accepts Abel's offerings. He has regard for Abel and his offering. So not only his offering was accepted, but Abel was accepted. And we see that God denied Cain's offering. He had no regard for it or Cain at that moment. We don't know how this happened, how one offering was accepted and the other one wasn't. Throughout the Old Testament, sometimes there's stories of a pillar of fire coming and consuming an offering that was accepted. Sometimes it was a verbal talking, like by God, actually verbally talking to his people. We see that through the story just before this with Adam and Eve. We also see this in this passage we read, the dialogue between God and Cain himself. But no matter what the situation was, it was made known by God. Abel's offering was accepted, Cain's was not. And there's a couple reasons why this is the case. One is that Abel's offering was a blood sacrifice. See, Abel knew that the forgiveness of sins had to come when blood was spilled. See, we see this as the, re the reason for sacrifices in the Old Testament. They're all leading up to Christ, who is going to live a perfect life, and he was going to be the perfect blood offering for his people, the final sacrifice ever needed. The second reason why Abel's offering was accepted was because of Abel's faith in God. You can look in Hebrews 11 verse 4, it says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was counted as righteous. Those words are also used when describing Abraham later in Genesis, where saying, By faith alone Abraham was counted righteous. Abel had faith in what God wanted him to do. Abel had faith in God and who he was. So we see Abel's sacrifice was accepted because of the heart of Abel, because he followed through with the offering the way God intended it to be. And then we see Cain being rejected because he was just simply going through the motions. He was not offering out of the faith in his heart. He was not following along with what God commanded him to do. He just went through the motions. And then we start to see Cain's anger. We see it filling his heart, his face falling away from God. This anger started in the heart and it began to eat at his very core. It was an overwhelming anger, something that was about to lead to a deadly action. See, sin does this. It sneaks its way into our hearts and builds up until it's too late. And then we see God trying to counsel Cain through his anger. In verses 6 and 7, the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. See, God sees the heart of Cain and the anger within it, just like God can see the sin in our own hearts. He knows that what's about to happen with Cain is something horrible, and he tries to help Cain. But Cain wants nothing to do with God. Think of it this way. When you're making tea or you're boiling a pot of water, first you start off with lukewarm water off the tap. And then you put it in the pot, and then you put it on the stove, and you crank the heat up. It slowly gets hotter and hotter and hotter. When it's ready, the tea kettle is going to make an annoying, scre annoying screech. And then if it's a pot of water, you're looking at a possible boil over. See, the same kind of thing is happening. The water's getting hotter and hotter. The sin in Cain's heart is getting stronger and stronger, and it's about to lead to Cain's boiling point. And that's what we see next. We see Cain getting to his boiling point. See, God has tried to help him, tried counseling him through his anger, but to no avail. But just like Cain, we also need to be able to look into our own hearts and see what we're holding on to. We have God and He's on our side. We have Him to run to instead of turn our back to. He warns Cain and He warns us to be aware of sin in our own hearts because it's always there crouching at our door. It's like a lion stalking its prey just waiting for the opportunity to jump out and show its ugly head. So while we might be jumping at the bit when we read this story to just be like, Cain, what are you doing? How are you doing that? First, we need to look into our own hearts. View our own sin. Because we can't control it without God's help. It's going to lead us to do some pretty serious, sinful actions. Just like it led Cain. And that's my next point. And that is the fact that sin in the heart produces sinful actions. 
Cain's sinful attitude filled up his heart until he couldn't handle it, and he struck his brother down in a field. It's important to know that this is all Cain. Abel did nothing to provoke Cain. As the youngest of three boys, um, and if you have older male siblings, you know that we wrestle, we fight, that's kind of what we do. But as the youngest, I was always the smallest, and I could never win as a show of force. So I had to play the mind game. I'd have to provoke them. I'd have to trick them. I'd have to make them do something so they could get grounded, so I would have more TV time or something, whatever the case may be. And I might sound like a brat. I was probably a brat, and that's fine. I'll take that. But see, nothing like that is happening here. It's all Cain. It's all Cain's anger. Abel did nothing to provoke him. Abel just did the right thing. So it's Cain and the anger being built up in his own heart that led him to kill his brother. Cain kills his brother. The anger in sin's heart had built up to a point where he acted out the act of murder, killing his own brother, an image of God. We know murder is wrong. It's our sixth commandment and our ten commandments. And throughout the Bible, it tells us we should love, not kill. And then, even more than that, God always goes into more detail because we need it. We don't get the idea the first time. And then in Genesis 9, 6, it talks about murder and it says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. See, God commands us not to murder. He says the penalty for death, the, the penalty for murder is death on you. And specifically the reason for that is because we're all made in the image of God. Every human being has made to be a reflection of God and his perfect nature. So God does not want that murdered. We are called not to murder. It's a pretty simple concept that everybody here would agree with. But sin will eat at that and rip that up and lead you to do something horrible just like it did for Cain. But murder is not the only sin here that we see through Cain. I know it's the one that gets all the attention usually when we read this, but it gets even worse. It gets darker if you ask me, because Cain now starts to distance himself further and further away from God, literally the opposite of what we're supposed to do. God comes to him, similar to the way that God came to Adam and Eve in the garden asking him questions, not because God doesn't know what Cain did, God's all-knowing and all-powerful, but he wanted to give Cain the opportunity to ask for forgiveness for what he has done. But Cain's response is scary, because he says, when God asks him, where's your brother, this is what Cain says, he says, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? It might be an easy sentence to read, but it's hard to understand, and it's really dark if you dive into it. This is coming from a man who knows God. He knows God knows what he did, but he is completely lying to God's face. And then he renounces his brotherhood. It's dark. One commentary, when talking about this specific line, says this, Cain's response is a shameful response to a question from a loving father. The finally Cain made his reply. Sin already had him in the grip of a vice. He renounced the rights of brotherhood. He refused to show respect to the eternal God. He brazenly leaned back on his own selfish defiance and spoke that which no one should dare to utter. On top of murdering his brother, Cain renounced his right to brotherhood, saying, I don't care about what happened to my brother. And he lied to God's face saying, I don't, I don't know where he is, I don't really care. Sin has completely messed up Cain's heart, and that's what can happen to our hearts too. Remember the illustration about the teapot. See, we see the actions of Cain are like that teapot boiling over, or the actions of the lion actually jumping out and pouncing on its prey. The sin was built up so much into Cain's heart, it reached a boiling point. The result was murder, and then further distancing himself from God through lies and an unrepentant and unbelieving heart. Just like Cain, we also are capable of such heinous actions. And again, that is why we need to be aware of our own sin. A problem left undetected is only going to get worse. Ask a mechanic. So with the help of those loved ones around us, the counsel of God through prayer, reading of scripture, sitting under sound, preaching, 
understanding the messiness and ugly truth that our life is filled with sin and we need help. When we do that, when you sit under all of those things, we will understand that we need to run to God instead of away from Him. We need to be able to look into our own hearts, understand that we have a problem with anger, with greed, with envy, with lust, you name it. It's all sin and it's all a twisted lie planted in our hearts. We as Christians are called like Cain was called to be aware of our sin, be aware that it's going to build up and lead to some pretty bad actions. But you know what, times we are not going to be able to help it. We will sin. Nobody is perfect. We're going to sin over and over again. But here's where the beauty of God comes in. Here's where the mercy and the grace comes from. And that's my final point, and that is that God still shows grace for the sinner. If you look back in our passage, you'll see again Cain being counseled by God. Now you never see Cain's salvation directly spoken to here. We see him leaving, going away, turning his face towards God, and you can pick up later, 17 onward, you can read more about Cain and what happened with him. But no matter what happened with Cain, God was always there until the end of our passage. God was with him through this entire story, trying to counsel him, asking him questions. Why are you feeling this way? What's going on in your heart? Where's your brother? Giving Cain opportunity after opportunity to confess his anger, his jealousy, his murder. But Cain didn't want anything to do with it. And there is punishment for Cain's actions. He was banished, and he was told nothing that he does of the ground will yield anything. Remember, he was a worker of the ground. God banished him and took away his very profession, his livelihood. So where's the grace in that? Well, see, sin still needs to be punished. It's a fact. Believers, Christians who truly believe in what Christ has done on the cross, we don't have to bear the harshest punishment of all, of eternal death and separation from God, because Christ paid that for us. But see, Cain's still punished here. Just like a child who did something wrong getting grounded, his actions led to a punishment. He did the wrong thing, something was taken from him. And then after the punishment is given out to Cain, you see the sob story of Cain and his response. Cain says, this punishment is more than I can bear. You've taken everything from me, my home, what I'm good at. I'm going to be a nomad. On top of that, when the word gets out of what I've done, they're going to just try to kill me. But God shows him mercy and grace, saying, no, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And that's when God placed the permanent mark of protection on Cain, so that anybody who comes across him will know this man is protected by God. And then Cain left. He went away from the presence of the Lord and his goodness. He went to Nod where he was supposed to live his life out as a fugitive and a wanderer. So we see God showing Cain grace even through his sin. Before he murdered Abel as a loving counseling father and even after the murder, giving him chance after chance to come back to God and repent of his sins. But even when Cain failed to do that, God still showed him grace after his punishment and that he was protected by God. See, remember, God calls us not to murder, so God does not want Cain's murder to lead to more and more death. But sadly, the world was getting worse if you continue reading Genesis. You'll get to a point where, right before Noah, God looks on every man's heart and all he sees is evil continually. The world's getting bad. But God still shows grace. And there is a distinction I want to make when I talk about grace. There's two types of grace that can hopefully make this make more sense. And that is, there is a saving grace, there's special grace, and then there's common grace. With special grace, that's the grace that's given to those who truly believe and have faith in God, those that submit to God and believe in what Christ accomplished through His life, death, and resurrection. See, the idea of special grace is that those who receive it get the forgiveness and are seen perfect and new in God's eyes. So that's special grace. But there's also another type of grace that's for everyone, and that is God's common grace. That's what's shown to Cain here. See, common grace is more of a universal grace because God created all things. God has grace for his entire creation. 
God loves the world. He made it originally good and perfect, and He still loves the world, and He shows grace to the world. Believers and non-believers, all living things of the earth. You can even see God's common grace in the flood. Think about it. God shows grace to His creation because He doesn't completely kill everything. Two of every animal is saved, mankind is saved. That's common grace. God still loves the entirety of all creation. J.I. Packer, a theologian, says it this way, God is good to all in some ways and to some in all ways. Those that receive the special saving grace have earned everything. They've earned eternal life because of what Christ has done. But no matter who you are, no matter what walk of life you're in, God still shows his common grace to you. So God shows this grace to Cain, and God still shows grace to the sinner, those that struggle with anger, with hatred, jealousy, envy, greed, lust. Or in other words, God still shows grace to us because we are those people. We are those who are sinners. Some of them and some of us who truly believe in what Christ has done, we will receive this special grace. And everybody else, no matter who you are, will receive God's common grace, no matter if you know it or not. And that's the beauty of it. So I want to conclude with this. First, I hope you can see through the story what sin can do. You see sin building up in the heart of Cain. So hopefully you can see the sin building up in our own hearts. You know that it can boil over and that the sin in our hearts can lead to a sinful action. And that even when we sin, God still shows us grace. Growing up, I was always a volunteer at the church I went to, and we always had VBS, which is Vacation Bible School. And it went all the way from preschool to fifth grade. And I mean, I remember one time, one of the summers, listening to a story between, or listening to a conversation between a preschool teacher and one of her students. And so I didn't catch the whole thing, but I got the gist of it. And what had happened was this little girl had bitten one of her classmates. See, and this is a common thing that I guess little kids do. I probably did it all the time. But, but this teacher could have approached it in two ways. She could have yelled at the child, said, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You don't bite people. But instead, she got down on her knees. She looked at the kid right in the eyes and said, we do not bite. We love. God does not want us to bite. God wants us to love. We do not bite. Really simple. A four-year-old can get that. We understand. It was a loving way of teaching this little girl a lesson. And this little girl had two options, really. She could basically run away, say, whatever, I'm going to do whatever I want, and go bite some more people. Or she could have apologized, saying, okay, I know I'm wrong. I'm really sorry. But what happened was even better. The girl immediately started to cry. And then she ran to the teacher. The teacher picked her up in her arms, held her, and the girl started screaming, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The teacher was holding her, saying, it's okay. Don't worry, it's okay. See, she understood that what she did was wrong, and she ran to the person that could help her, make her feel better. Just like that little girl, Cain had the option to run to God. Say, I'm sorry for what I've done. Forgive me. But instead, Cain ran from him. Us as believers, we are called to do the same thing when we sin. When we struggle with sin, we are told to run to our loving, gracious, merciful Father so He can pick us up in His arms, tell us it's going to be okay, that He forgives us. He releases us from the punishment of sin because of the beautiful sacrificial work of Christ, because Christ's blood sacrifice covers all of our sin. When we have faith in Him, we are made new in His eyes. So run to your Father. He is here for us when we sin. And my challenge to you is to do just that, to know the evils of sin and the effects of it in our own hearts. Know that it can lead to some sinful actions, but also know that when we do sin, God is there waiting for us to come to Him. His arms are open wide. We can run to Him, bawling our eyes out, saying, God, Father, forgive me. Hold me in your arms. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for your amazing, beautiful grace. We do not deserve it. 
but you freely give it. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for, for your word and how it can enlighten our lives, God. How it can tell us just how sinful we are and how much we do need you. We cannot come to salvation on our own. The only way we can come to it is through Christ and his blood. Lord God, we thank you for that. We thank you for that sacrifice you made for us, for your people. We love you and we praise you and we honor you. And you are the only one worthy of all of that. Amen.